Fantastic. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, you're at the Build Back Better Shifting Tides in the Water Sector webinar hosted by Sustainability in the ERM Group Company. Really pleased to have you with us today. Um, it's an important topic that we will be discussing, which is the, the wide world of water, particularly in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals and the next 10 years that we have to achieve them and the innovations that will be crucial to them. So hopefully you're able to stick with us for the next hour or so. Uh, before we go much further, would, would want to say it's probably important to have a glass of water near you, stay hydrated if you're in a, in a warm climate. Um, I'm joining you from the UK where it's actually surprisingly warm today in, in London. And of course, if you're able to, to join us over your, your lunch break, depending on where you are, um, we're happy to have you. I might pass into the next slide. I'm just gonna set us up um, for the next hour's discussion. Um, I'm Denise Delaney, so I'm a, a partner at Sustainability and we'll be facilitating the conversation with our excellent speakers, um, Tom and Karen coming up. And if you don't know much about sustainability, we are a think tank and strategy consulting consultancy working to inspire transformative business leadership on the sustainability agenda and really del delighted to host this webinar um, in partnership with the, the Zayed Sustainability Prize. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, but if we just go to the next slide, I'll quickly introduce who we have with us on the line, who you can see um, live at the top of your screen if you, you're uh, dialed in that way. We've got Karen Kuchnek. Uh, she is Group Program Manager of the 2030 Water Resources Group at the World Bank and Tom Williams, Director of Water for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, or WBCSD. So really delighted to have them with us, sharing their, uh, their perspectives, their experience, their insights on water and what's the latest in innovation and what we hope will, will get us to um, 2030 with all of the success we need in this wide, uh, wide world of water. Okay, let's just now take us into a little bit more about why we're, we're talking about this and, and the, the prize um, that we're hoping to, to encourage and inspire some, some applications to. So we're, we're delighted to be partnering with the Zayed Sustainability Prize, which is the UAE's pioneering global award in sustainability and, and is a tribute to the late founding father of the UAE as well. It was actually established in 2008, initially um, actually recognizing um, and rewarding achievement in, in energy and it branched out and, and evolved over the recent years to cover not only energy, but health, food, um, and water. And there's also a program around um, supporting schools as well. And the key is really recognizing and rewarding the, the achievement of those driving high impact, innovative, and inspiring sustainability solutions. Um, so you would tend to find prize recipients, if you go to the website, who are in startups, who are in nonprofit situations, they might be resource organizations, um, really doing some of the most innovative work in these spaces. Um, due to the, the pandemic environment, uh, we, they have actually extended the deadline for applications. So we really hope um, that if this is you know, relevant and of interest to you, you have, you're really working on something uh, integral here that you've got until the 11th of June um, to get that in and you can find all the information on the website. And I'll, I'll recap this at the end as well to make sure that you um, don't miss out. Don't mind popping to the next slide. Also, just to, to detail a, a, a little bit, um, the prize itself also takes uh, the framing from the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, um, and we're specifically looking for a very clear sustainable and humanitarian development mission. Um, so again, the key, key criteria here for, for uh, successful prize winners have been really focused on the innovation, on the high impact um, where the, their um, project is playing out and really inspiring uh, a number of solutions. So I encourage you to take a look into that. Before we get into the, the discussion with Tom and Karen, our experts here, I just want to spend a, a moment briefly on the context here. And I, I think really, as, as I mentioned already, that the imperative here is to meet the sustainable development goals. And, and the fact that we're sat here in 2020, um, looking at 2030, which in some ways seems far away, it's really only 10 years to tackle the most pressing societal challenges. And I think um, in some dimensions, we probably wish we had slightly more time. So we take this global call to action to really be um, the, the reason that we're, we're convening and, and, and understanding how we can get there and the, and the interventions that are needed, particularly related to water, but also recognizing that, that water is connected to many other areas that you would see um, in, in this framework here. We know that every country is expected to report on their progress um, and businesses have a really critical role to play in achieving the SDGs as well. Um, so we're really interested to see across all these different dimensions of society. Um, where the innovation is coming from and, and how it can be best supported. Next slide, please. Just to deep dive again, make it a bit more specific. 
there's lots of nexus connections here, but if you look at um, the SDG 6 here around clean water and sanitation, you dubbed you know, the water goal in many ways, this is where you'll, you'll see um, some of the, the, the areas that we might touch on. So it's all about ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Um, and some of you will be familiar with the, the somewhat dire statistics we have around the water situation with you know, a third of people lacking access to safe drinking water in the world or two out of five not having access to basic hand washing facilities, which in, again, in the context of an, an infectious disease pandemic is a, is a really um, crucial feature. We have shortfalls in freshwater resources, a whole host of, um, of challenges here. Um, and conscious too that the UN uh, General Assembly launched the Water Action Decade um, just two years ago to also help mobilize action to support um, the transformation of how we manage water. So we're, we're you know, part of this broader um, decade of action to 2030 and some supporting actions around that. So a bit more specific to pinpoint, well, water is such a broad topic. What are some of the, the areas of concern and, and areas that we hope to see some innovation in a broad sense? One would be the waste of water. Um, and just to pick one element of that here, um, agriculture, we know that demand for water is going to continue to rise as, as the world changes and grows. And yet we know that we waste more than half of the fresh water that we use for agriculture. So it's a really challenging uh, dynamic that as we meet the needs of a growing population, we also need to look at how our practices and how um, we ensure that waste of that water doesn't, doesn't go up. Another dimension is water stress, um, not new, but, but certainly a, a, a a more permanent um, context, if you like, growing parts of the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, um, showing some really high levels of water stress and, and some of the activities uh, in some of the parts of the world and, and also elsewhere are impacting ecosystems there that historically have replenished water flows and provided some natural filters. Um, so that's another, another risk around water that we need to be thinking about. about. And it makes water very, very much a local, uh, local concern as well as a global one. Another dimension uh, mentioned in some of the statistics here is around access. So, so lack of access uh, to water and, and poor sanitation are, are really drivers of poor health across the world. We mentioned some of the, the lack of um, access to water, 1.1 billion. Um, some say 2.7 billion find water scarce for at least one month of the year and, and how that impacts uh, families and, and livelihoods. And the, the challenge around sanitation, um, there's huge exposure to disease through, through the lack of, of suitable sanitation and, and, and deaths that are attributed to um, related diseases, particularly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that, that's a real challenge. Um, so water is not just a, um, it's, it's an issue in many dimensions, not least of which health is a major one. And the final kind of big, big topic, I suppose we want to put, uh, put or shine some of a light on is, is pollution or, or water quality. Um, so pollution continues to be a challenge and it, and it comes from diverse places. It could be industrial waste. Um, it can be, uh, for instance, coming from the things that we ingest ourselves, be that uh, medicines that potentially end up going through, uh, through to water sources. Uh, we know that 80% of the world's wastewater is, is largely dumped untreated back into the environment, which is, which is a huge concern. Um, and one of the topics I work on some of the time, antimicrobial resistance, is, is also linked here. Um, so antibiotics that we take um, as humans or that we use in agriculture or raising animals, um, that hospitals need to dispose of, find their way back into water and, and the environment and, and is, is, is a real challenge for us. Quickly, just wanted to forecast as well from, from other sources, so how we're seeing water um, you know, in 2020 and what's on the horizon. The World Economic Forum uh, risk report mentioned a few uh, dimensions here. So very much linking water stress to other environmental problems. I think there's a, a lot of um, attention recently on the links between water stress, for instance, um, and, and climate change, the demands from agriculture. There's a higher level or higher order lack of a system of systems thinking or systems um, led approach in that. So there's, there's systemic failures. And again, it's not lost on, on us that we're speaking about this topic in the context of a pandemic. The world is very interconnected um, and we, we probably will struggle to, to think in silos uh, in the future. There's a lack of awareness as well. Um, so though there is more momentum that we can point to. There is some suggestion that perhaps it's, it's not as high up of some of the agendas as it, as it should be. Um, and also that there's some decisions around water, particularly allocation, uh, that aren't always made 
um, in a connected way. So they're made in, in, a, in isolation, looking at perhaps say the economic costs and benefits without necessarily looking at uh, local water stress or some of the socioeconomic uh, benefits or consequences of, of those decisions. And finally, just to again, see, see some further conversation in case and maybe Tom, Tom and Karen will react to some of this. You know, this leads to two things. One, some, some thoughts on solution areas and another on practices. So in terms of solutions, I mentioned already, but it's this idea that food, energy and water potentially, you know, forms this, this nexus and this is a new concept, but perhaps is one that we want to look at with, with a new, uh, new data, new experience sitting here in 2020. What, what does that um, tell us? Where are the trade-offs embedded in decisions around um, any one of these elements? How can we, uh, by contrast, look at um, water-related investments? Um, so that might, might involve, you know, certain energy generation, certain jurisdictions and, and authorities. Um, how can investors get involved and, and potentially drive positive activity there? Some additional thoughts and solutions on our next slide. One around the broader growth in green infrastructure. Um, so amidst the challenging um, economic environment for many and, and tight budgets, there's interest in how, how can green infrastructure approaches, including water management, help protect, restore, or mimic natural water cycles, for instance? What's the potential there? Um, and also coming back to this idea of wastewater reuse, again, not a new idea, but hopefully something we can look at with the new energy and, and new ideas. Um, how can wastewater be reused to be an additional source? Um, how can that be used, for instance, in, in irrigation, going back to that agricultural example? And finally, just to comment on a few of, of the solutions in practice, um, conscious that while well, this is very much a global issue and, and, and it often plays out in a very local and contextualized way. Uh, so thinking about whether there's market-based mechanisms where, for instance, downstream stakeholders can incentivize those upstream um, to manage water in the best way. So there's the concept of watershed payments. There's a broader movement around natural capital uh, management. So for instance, is there data um, around about land and water um, management modeling that we can do to drive better decision making? Can we better value ecosystems? All, all questions um, I pose to, to Tom and Karen to, to see what has traction here. And, and finally, two more thoughts to see this conversation. So one around capital markets, where um, can we drive better environmental impact? Um, through different instruments, so environmental impact bonds, uh, broader in the broader field of green bonds could drive funding towards you know, scaling water solutions, perhaps some of the innovations we hope to, to see supported by the prize. And of course, also the development of, of water markets. Um, is there a viable water trading marketplace, um, like water benefit certificates? Um, is there more to, to make economically viable water solutions um, part, of, part of the future? We'll see. Um, I want to put it to, to our panelists to, to comment. Uh, so hopefully it gave you a bit of food for thought of some of the different innovation solutions that we're seeing at a, at a fairly high level. Um, but want to invite first Karen and, and then Tom to share a little bit about the work um, that they've been doing and then we'll, we'll go into discussion. So do want to encourage everyone on the line to share um, questions through the, the Q&A and chat function and I'll be checking those periodically as we get into discussion uh, shortly. But for now, Karen, do you want to tell us a bit more about the work you've been doing around coronavirus and, and water? Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Denise. Um, yes, so maybe briefly, um, you've laid out the problems really well. Um, certainly, um, you know, they're, they're stark um, in terms of the challenges. And now on top of this, we have this pandemic, right? Um, on top of already the challenges that you shared. And, and I will say um, it's been a struggle is I think one of the ones you put on there is in terms of is kind of making sure water is a top priority. Um, and I certainly can say I was involved in the World Summit on Sustainable Development if we go back to the early 2000s. Um, and in that process, I remember the first um, documents that were coming out of that process, water was not even included or mentioned in there. Um, many of the groups fought and, and pushed hard and in the end water was included and recognized, but in the beginning it wasn't in the very early stages. And then if we fast forward to the development of the sustainable development goals, there was also a period of time when water was not going to have its own goal. Um, it was definitely something that was being discussed and considered 
the feeling was that water is kind of everywhere and it'll be embedded in all the different goals, but not to have its own, uh, own sustainable development goal. And many groups um, and governments pushed hard on that and were able to get SDG 6, at, yeah, as you've outlined. And I think that was extremely a, a, a good step forward building on the Millennium Development Goals. But it has been obviously a, a difficult road to get water prioritized. And as you lay that out, as continues. Now with the pandemic, we have this on top of everything else to make sure that water is a priority. If you can push and go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, you've already mentioned in terms of the statistics, you know, the amount of people without basic hand washing facilities, lack of basic drinking water services. Um, as we say, without water, soap doesn't work. Um, so the challenge, especially with COVID-19, um, you see, you know, it's very fast changing situation huge economic disruptions, um, huge segments of the populations that are poor and unserved already before the pandemic. And now how do we get access to services for those populations, um, especially as you know, they're falling even further on the economic ladder. Um, and this is where I think, you know, this idea you even brought up, you know, the role of the private sector is really important. Um, I was actually in New York when the sustainable development goals were being adopted. And I have to say, it was the first time in my career, having been spent time or in the United Nations processes, when governments actually mentioned the private sector um, and that it was important to have the private sector involved in achieving the SDGs. And that's really, I think, why SDG 17 is there is for partnerships, including with the private sector and civil society. Um, and this is actually what, um, in essence, helped um, generate the development of 2030 Water Resources Group, which is what I manage. It was actually, you mentioned the Global Risk Report of, of the World Economic Forum. Um, if you go back to the mid 2000s is when water crises started coming onto the Global Risks Report. And this is where government leaders um, and private sector companies came together and said, well, how do we solve these challenges? Um, it's not one institution alone will never be able to solve the water challenges. It really requires a collective solution approach. And even now with COVID-19, we see these um, collaborations are even more important to build on innovations. And as you've raised, drive innovations and adaptive strategies forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so 2030 Water Resources Group was created um, um, in that period of time when water crisis was coming on the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report with the idea of that collective action is really critical if we're going to address the, the, the depth and the breadth of, of water challenges. Um, so you'll see 2030 Water Resources Group, we have over 809 partners in 14 countries. Um, and the key um, with the partnerships is really to create structured partnerships. Um, what we create are multi-stakeholder platforms that are very structured, that are chaired by the highest level of government, and they include private sector and civil society. So they'll have a high level steering board and they'll have also work streams that focus on specific issues like agriculture and water, which you've touched upon the real challenges there, industrial water management, which also you touched upon, <clears throat> urban water management, green infrastructure solutions and so forth. So the idea is to get partners to come together to drive collective solutions in a very structured way um, and, and, and really drive to innovate. Um, in essence, create a safe space for innovation because with innovation, there comes failure many times. And so you need that safe space to innovate. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. And this is my last one, um, just to really share 2030 Water Resources Group, as I said, really came and catalyzed out of this process of the World Economic Forum to catalyze new innovations of bringing stakeholders together um, in addressing the big water challenges we have. Um, and so you'll see our global partners up there on the right of the screen. But again, I mentioned the 800 partners. Those are the partners in countries where change is being driven. And that happens through these, these multi-stakeholder platforms through either development of innovations, uh, solutions that can be scaled. It could be policy reform processes. It's really up to the stakeholders to decide together what they're going to act, actually work on and deliver. Um, and, and in COVID-19, the multi-stakeholder platforms have pivoted to try and address the, the serious challenges we have right before us. Um, but we wanted to make sure as we frame the response to COVID-19 through the multi-stakeholder platforms 
that it is also the short-term responses, but it's also the medium and long-term responses. So short-term responses, for example, in Bangladesh, we've been partnering with Unilever, Red Crescent Society, and a long list of other partners on providing wash services in all 64 districts. So supplying drinking water to hospitals also as well, and then conducting a public education campaign to reach 20 million people um, around the pandemic and wash. Um, so that's you know, something to do near term critical. But then, as I said, we need to also focus in on the medium term as well. Um, and so there, for example, in Mexico, we're working with the stakeholders to develop an assessment of the operational and financial institutions implications on water utilities. Um, water utilities are facing a dire situation right now. Um, and so how do we strengthen water allocation regimes um, and, and create structures that ensure the liquidity of these facilities and utilities for the long term and create resilience to these shocks. And then in the longer term, which we can come back to is, um, I would say, kind of circular economy approaches, as you flagged, is how do we build um, wastewater treatment across agriculture, industry, and urban? Um, so I just want to flag that, you know, the multi-stakeholder platforms, 2030 Water Resources Group, are really there to drive collective solutions. I think in the next 10 years, we have huge challenge to meet the SDGs. Let's be honest about that. We've known that for quite some time, even before the pandemic hit. Um, and I would say that SDG 17 is more critical than ever if we're really going to be serious about tackling all the other SDGs, including water, SDG 6. So maybe let me stop there um, and happy to then come back and, and discuss more on the innovations and how multi-stakeholder platforms can create that safe space to innovate forward. Excellent. Th thank you so much, Kara. That's really helpful both to sharing more about what the uh, what the 2030 Water Resources Group is doing and also seeding yeah, lots of, of future uh, follow-ups there. Want, want to come back to so much there, but also want to give a chance to Tom here to introduce um, himself and the work around WBCSD. And uh, please have Tom joining. I, mean, I mentioned Karen's based in the States. Tom's normally based in India, but is in, in the UK um, in the time of, of COVID-19 here. So Tom, over to you. Thanks a lot, um, Denise. Um, and as you say, I'm normally based in India and, and WBCSD um, has been working um, with Karen's team, 2030 Water Resources Group in India for a few years now and um, testimony to the work they do on those multi-stakeholder platforms. It's really impressive. For those of you who are not familiar with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we're 25 years old this year. We're an organization that has 200 member companies all working towards sustainable solutions for systems transformation. And we work across uh, six program areas, uh, food and nature, climate and energy, uh, circular economy, people, redefining value and cities and mobility. And as you can imagine, water um, often cuts across all of these areas. Um, you know, Denise touched on some of those nexus issues earlier. Uh, next slide, please. WBCSD has been working on water for uh, over 15 years now, um, working with a variety of different sectors in, in different settings and developing uh, a variety of tools, frameworks and reports on issues such as water valuation, uh, circular water management and risk management, for example. And we have worked with members on issues um, to do with domestic water use, industrial water use um, and in agricultural water use, so you know, across the whole spectrum. Uh, next slide, please. Our focus for 2020 is around three work streams. Uh, the first is on water stewardship. Uh, later this year, we'll be releasing a report which is on SDG 6.3, um, which is largely about water quality, but in part about wastewater treatment and reuse. And we heard that statistic er earlier that 80% of uh, wastewater is discharged without being treated to the environment. So the report is talking about um, the business imperative to take action there. The second work stream is metrics and targets. Uh, this year we are focusing on developing a water circularity metric which helps companies at a facility level to move um, towards um, a net uh, improvement in, in water management at the basin scale. And then lastly on water valuation, and here we're distilling lessons um, from a number of our member companies on how they've incorporated uh, water valuation into business decision making, for example, um, investment decisions. Um, just lastly to mention in the context of, of COVID and, and what we've been doing more recently, um, which comes within our water stewardship work, we have something called the WASH Pledge, uh, which is a business commitment to take action 
on water sanitation and hygiene um, within their facilities, within their supply chains and within their communities. We launched this back in 2013. We've got 53 companies that have signed the WASH, WASH pledge and are committed to taking actions to improve WASH facilities within uh, each of those different domains. And we think now that in the current situation, as, as the world gets um, ready to go back to the factory, the office, um, farmers get ready to go back to the field, for example, the WASH pledge and the guidance it has is, is really critical. So we actually rolled out a revised um, WASH, WASH pledge just last week. So if you go to WBCSD's website, you'll be able to find that. So I'll stop there. Hopefully it's just giving a bit of a sense of the scope and topics that WBCSD works on. Absolutely, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Tom. So want to want to take it a bit into some of the questions that have come at least to my mind and we'll see if, if others um, have more as well. And, and please do if you're on the line, join through the Q&A box here, but I want to kind of take one at the outset. So we've got the SDGs, very high aspiration that we have for the 2030 agenda with the added pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and necessity in a way being the mother of invention here as, as, we, as we know. Do you think, and, and both, both Karen and Tom here, do you think we'll come out of the pandemic with innovations in, in the space of water that have broader applications that will advance the field? Or really is it, is, is it about kind of getting across those you know, both those the short, medium, and long-term um, aspirations, Karen, with, with different, it will be different solutions, or is there anything we think will actually advance the, the wider field based on the, the pressures of the pandemic today? Well, I, I don't know, Tom, maybe I, can I just, I'll just kick off um, there. I, I do think we will advance. Um, I do think, you know, certainly the pandemic has um, put a light on the issues in a way that, you know, we haven't had that before. Um, as we've been putting water higher on the, you know, the political agenda. Um, you know, I think one of the things if we look at, so the World Bank did a study on citywide inclusive water supply, and it was particularly around SDG 6.1. And so if you look at the urban population and growth of urban population, we're going to have about 1 billion people by 2030 um, accessing water that doesn't meet the Joint Monitoring Program safely managed water. Um, and those are really people in the poorest segments of society. So one of the things that has come out of this, I think, is looking at um, what we call off-grid solutions, right? Um, you know, the idea is that um, piped service delivery of water um, certainly has, you know, helped a certain part of the world, many parts of the world, um, leap forward in terms of um, urban growth, but that this kind of piped water service delivery will not be kind of able to manage and go effectively forward, particularly because there's so many issues related to um, governance, um, effectiveness, you know, financial solutions and so forth. So I think one area for particularly that we're starting to see more of now, particularly even in COVID-19, is kind of more decentralized solutions and off-grid solutions. Um, and I think there, you know, while they've existed, there's always been a challenge of scaling these types of decentralized and off-grid solutions. And I think with the, the pandemic, now we're pushing even further to say, is there a way to scale these different efforts? And many private sector companies are coming in um, with different solutions. So I do think it's going to push us further on innovation than perhaps if we hadn't had this kind of dire situation of, you know, of lack of access to water, um, you know, and even, you know, in, in many countries, even just as I said, looking in terms of our, our water infrastructure, how do we deal with aging water infrastructure, for example. So there's much more attention being paid. And I think that's where some of these solutions have, may have been, you know, certainly have been there. It's not to say all everything is new, but I think some of the issues of how do we scale some of these innovations certainly have been lagging behind. Mm, very interesting. So, so yeah, a lot, a lot there on scale, and a lot of. And you mentioned the term you know, off-grid solutions. A lot of perhaps, um, uh, yeah, complementary or parallel concepts coming from other areas. Of, you know, energy is the one, one that you know, that conjures, and, and interesting to see that um, framing with water as well. If I might, maybe well, Tom, do you want to come in on on that question? Or kind of how how COVID will impact um, the broader space of, of innovation in this. In this Day and, and, it, and I think in part it comes back to the thing we keep talking about, and that's the connectivity of water to other um, system sectors, for example. Um, you know, we see how important water is for food, for energy, for climate. What we see right now is how you know, water is important and always has been important in a public health context, but water is, as a first line um, defense for you know, public health um, crises like we're going through now. So 
thinking from a business perspective, I think what will be interesting to, to, to understand over the coming months, particularly with fast moving consumer goods, particularly hygiene and hair comb, home care brands, for, for example, that require water and you know, soaps and detergents, is to understand how consumer behavior um, might change in the, in the long term and how that might impact people's relationship um, with water um, as it relates to, 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 to self hygiene, to home hygiene, for example, and understanding some of the innovations um, that come around there. And of course, any innovations that you might make in the home might be related to, to, to energy, for example, because um, the energy requirement for, for using water in a home is, is quite high. So I think it's around these interconnectivities of, of systems, sectors, where water really resonates. And at the moment, it, it's in public health. So it'd be interesting to see what new innovations really come to the fore as it relates to water being a first line of defense for public health. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I want, I want to pick up a couple of questions coming in through the, the box here. So Karen, specifically to you, so there's a question around whether you see the multi-stakeholder platforms of, of your program expanding to, to other geographies and, and, and including smaller scale companies. So as they put it, not the Coca-Colas of the world, but um, places like Chile perhaps, or medium scale agricultural companies. Are they in scope for, for your platform? Absolutely. I mean, our strategic plan had called for an expansion of 2030 Water Resources Group multi-stakeholder platforms to more countries. Um, we started that process last year already with starting to scope countries where you know there's water scarcity issues where there is potential to bring government private sector and civil society organizations together um, to be solutions oriented um, so we've in, started that process um, already beyond the 14 where we are um, we are now working with the governments of rwanda for example government of pakistan the government of Madhya pradesh and in india who've um, asked you know, to come in and support the creation of a 2030 WRG multi-stakeholder platform. And we have about 25 other countries kind of on the list um, to come in and partner with organizations. And very much so, it is very much in terms of, you know, the large multinationals, but also national companies, small and medium enterprises as well in countries. The work is really in the countries, really. It's the stakeholders in countries that drive the solutions. Um, and so the multi-stakeholder platforms are very much open in terms of the range of companies, the type of companies. Um, we have textile companies, we have agribusiness, um, technology companies in a number of countries where mining is a predominant issue, mining companies as well. So it's absolutely, the multi-stakeholder platforms are there for the stakeholders to come together. As I said, they're chaired by government, the highest level of government. So it'll be a cabinet secretary or chief secretary or minister. Um, but it'll include the companies and civil society organizations seated at the same table, driving solutions together um, at different levels. So absolutely, it's very much open and we look forward to partnering with organizations as we expand into more countries. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Karen. And what I might do is actually share just a few of the questions that are coming up on the, on the chat screen so we can, you both can, can reflect on them and prepare. We take them in turn. So one is specifically to WBCSC, I think, what are some of the circular water metrics that you're, you're using? So it'd be interesting to, to get into that. But also want to flag, as I imagine Karen might also have some comments around, you know, risk management of water at the national or regional level. So I guess maybe curious if the multi-stakeholder platforms um, operating at that kind of national or regional level um, or, or perhaps more site or, or organization specific. Um, maybe we'll so come over to Tom and come back, um, see if, if you also want to comment on this, this national regional question. But first, the circular water metrics. Yeah, so this is something in development at the moment, and it, it, it stems from some work we've done within our circular economy team, which was looking at circular transition indicators more, more broadly. They started to look at water as part of that last year, and, and maybe as, as people who work in water field understand, it's quite complex. Um, so we're working with a group of member companies this year to develop the metric. It should be finished by the end of the year. So we'll go through a process of, of, of piloting, for example. But effectively, what we're looking at is, is both inflow and outflow. So where are you sourcing your water? How circular is that source? And then at the outflow, how circular are you discharging that water? So it's trying to drive circular decision making that impacts at the basin level. So it's not necessarily what you're doing in the facility but it's about what you're doing within the context of the basin and how you can make decisions um, to be using water in a much more circular way. Mm, interesting. So I'm sure um, some of our, our participants will be interested to see the outcomes of, of that work this year. Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. And, and Karen, curious about this kind of national and regional uh, lens to some of the, the work around, around risk management. 
Well, so the multi-stakeholder platforms are national. Um, they're developed at the national level with the government ministries. Um, apologies, I don't know if you can hear some of the background noise. I apologize for that here. Um, but they're developed at the national scale with the government ministries. Um, so the multi-stakeholder platforms will include all of the relevant ministries, the ministries of water, agriculture, industry, planning, um, finance, all of the ministries, and as I said, private sector and civil society organizations. So they are organized at the national scale and drive collective decision making at that scale. Um, and many times, as you know, with water issues, though, they're at a watershed level where you have to tackle the challenges. So oftentimes we'll see the development of multi-stakeholder platforms also at the river basin or watershed scale. So in a number of countries, we have ones at the national level. For example, in Tanzania, um, we have one at the national level, but then also in the Kilimanjaro watershed, there's a Kilimanjaro platform. Um, similar in Bangladesh, we have one at the national level chaired by the cabinet secretary, but there's been an evolution um, to develop ones at the subnational level. And the idea is that these um, platforms then feed into each other back and forth in terms of looking at what solutions can be out there, whether those are projects or policy reform processes and drive that sharing of experiences. So there's quite a bit, I would say, of learning and sharing that happens across the multi-stakeholder platforms within countries, but also across countries. Um, so pre-COVID-19, we actually supported um, exchanges between multi-stakeholder platforms um, to be able to learn and see what's happening in one country and sharing with another country. So we were quite actively doing that. Obviously now it's all online, um, but the continuing and learning continues among the multi-stakeholder platforms to see what's being done in one country and how can it be then potentially replicated and adapted in another country. Um, so that's very much part of the agenda of the multi-stakeholder platforms is constant learning and sharing um, to see how you can take one solution in one place and drive it. So for example, in Peru, we've had a number of innovations out of the multi-stakeholder platform that are now being looked at in other countries of Latin America, for example. Interesting. Okay. And interesting to maybe weave in a, a follow-up question to, to both of you really around. So we mentioned some of the, the different partners and, and some of the different groups or companies that WBCSD convened, some of the uh, water resources group, you know, quite large companies. And in, in a developing country context, one of our, our participants um, asks, you know, how do you, how can you motivate companies in developing countries to support water stewardship? So if, if, perhaps getting beyond I guess uh, some of the, the multinationals we've mentioned, and, and I almost wonder with that question, you know, where's the, the innovation happening? Is it in, in the big, large companies? Is it in the smaller startup entities? And, and how does, uh, how, you know, how do you see your roles in, just fo in fostering innovation more broadly, if you, if you will? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can come in there and, you know, what, what's motivating business? Um, maybe I can speak from experience in India, where we work very closely with both Indian companies, but also multinationals. Um, it's about business continuity. It, it's affecting the bottom line. Um, water is impacting on, on factories, uh, on supply chains, and on communities, which are customers of, of business, for example. Um, and what we often, the, the terminology we often use to sort of push companies a little bit more is about moving beyond the fence line. It's not just actions that you take within your factory, but it's actions you take with your suppliers and, and in the communities um, that you, you know, get your employees from or you're selling uh, goods and services into, uh, as well. And this is where the multi-stakeholder platforms um, become a, a very powerful instrument because they enable business to actually collaborate with civil society um, and, and um, uh, public sector as well. And I think a, a, a big thing that we see moving as well is around um, internalizing water externality. So understanding that mm -hmm. There are various business impacts and dependencies on water in terms of water use or water pollution, as we as we heard all earlier. So helping business to understand what their impacts and dependencies on water. And when, for example, you can monetize those kinds of impacts and dependencies and you see how how um, how your your profit or, or, or how your revenue is really dependent upon having reliable, um, adequate access to to water or it's re it's reliant upon suppliers who can uh, readily access um, good quality water as well. So certainly in India, we're seeing um, many of the CEOs that I engage with being kept awake at night because of water, um, not enough water, too much water or too dirty water. So I, I do see a lot of attention in developing countries like India from, from uh, business CEOs and, and some innovations that, that help to solve those problems. Interesting, really well, 
but yeah, encouraging to hear and and um, really powerful. Karen, what about you? Any any reflections on, on that? No, I mean, I think Tom hit it exactly right. I would the add, thing I would add is, I mean, I, for the companies, you know, the smaller companies and the medium sized companies in countries, um, you know, we've had I've had many conversations with companies where you know even the best they do, they can say, look, we can be a clean fish, but in a dirty pond, right? Mm -hmm. So they really see right away, you know, water is so, a shared risk. Um, and so I think, you know, particularly these opportunities like SDG 17, right? Bringing partnerships together is really important even for the more, the medium and smaller companies so that they can kind of jumpstart learning on innovations. Um, and that's where I think particularly with our multi-stakeholder platforms, it's not the size of the company, right? It's, it's being able to bring in that collective spirit that we want to learn and work together. And I would say even with the larger multinational companies that are partners with 2030 Water Resources Group, you know, they feel the shared water risks as much as well and are working in a pre-competitive space to address these shared risks. Um, and so I, we don't see it as really a size matters. It's more of that, are you willing to kind of bring in that collective spirit to work together to tackle these problems, roll up your sleeves and really solve these problems together. That's really what it comes to. And we see that with the broadest range of companies, regardless of size. Interesting. It was, it was encouraging to hear this stuff. Yeah, the, the ideas and, and the innovation. And um, you mentioned, used the phrase earlier, creating a safe space to innovate, which which I really liked. I want to. Um, I'm going to come back to some of the Q and A from the group, but did want to um, make sure we covered the idea of technology uh, because it, it's heralded in, in in so many ways as the, the solution to many of our challenges, and, and and it can be a godsend. You know, is is there a silver bullet technology that we expect um, to come online at some stage in the water space, or or, or not? Are the greatest innovations potentially in, in a physical, you know, technology or, or something, or is it about further implementation, application of what we know to be, you know, good practice and, and spreading that around the world? How do you see technology in, in, in the water world? Okay. Tom? Yeah, um, yeah, so, you know, happy to come in here. And for me, it's it's largely about the application of technology. You know, how do you incentivize the uptake of technology? How do you ensure that they are being used in such a way that it solves the problem it sets out to do. For example, if you look at something like micro irrigation, you know, a game changing technology for, for water in agricultural space. If you don't have the policy and finance incentives in place for farmers to use it, if you don't have the data on the performance levels, if you don't have advisory support services for farmers to support its application, for example, you probably won't achieve water efficiency. So it's less about the technology per se. We've got some great technologies out there and, and you know, new technologies will come online. But until we get to grips with this um, application and deployment of, of technology and all those enabling factors that, that enable them, I think we're only gonna be you know, very incrementally um, addressing these border challenges. We really need to look at how, how technology is, is taken on and, and, and applied in, in you know, all across domestic, agriculture and industrial sectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. So the, the, so the, the, the proof will lie in the application. Interesting. Karen, do you agree? A different view? No, no, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, there are new innovations coming along. So for example, some of our platforms have been looking at IOT metering around pollution measurement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think particularly in the pollution space, I think there is the possibility of, of new innovations. Um, I do think, um, you know, the kind of we all talk about AI and machine learning and how this can kind of be applied. We're seeing this, for example, in our work in Mongolia, where our multi-stakeholder platform is really pushing hard on groundwater data management. Groundwater has always been one of those kind of, I would say, I don't know how to describe it as kind of the stepchild kind of left behind and not considered. Um, and so I think when it comes to kind of issues around pollution, and maybe groundwater particularly, there can be technology innovations um, that we may have not seen before. Um, I do think, you know, um, Tom hit it right, though, in terms of kind of the policy space. And I mean, if I can raise, so World Business Council on Sustainable Development, 2030 Water Resources Group and the World Economic Forum are part of a, a collaboration called 50 Liter Home Coalition with a number of companies, um, including Procter & Gamble and a number of companies. And the idea is to create homes that are 
um, have 50 liters of water, but feel like 500 liters of water. And I think, you know, there's could be great innovations that will come from this. We're really looking forward to, to the innovations, but also part of the dialogue is around the policy changes that will need to occur and also the financing instruments that will need to be developed to drive these innovations at scale. So um, I completely agree with Tom. I mean, and this is where, you know, we keep coming back to Technology, certainly there's a great deal out there, but especially when it comes to water, because, you know, water um, kind of in the political economy of countries depends heavily on how it's um, the policies are set in place, how it's regulated um, and how the financing can come in. So I think those are critical components of any innovations coming forward. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So definitely clear from both of you, technology not in isolation and, and very much around the, the supporting kind of infrastructure and, and context for it. Um, interesting. want to pull um, some of the questions up from, from the Q&A here. So one which I think really almost gets to the heart of some of the, the that connectivity and interconnectedness that we were talking about earlier. So specifically, they ask, how about the problems of climate change leading to migration and then putting further strain on national or regional water needs of populations? Who is thinking about these issues? So really interesting uh, question here. It really, you know, links some of the biggest issues of, of our day and almost, you know, a, a migratory or moving, um, I suppose, water demand, if you if you like. Um, thoughts of kind of how you've seen maybe some of the platforms or any examples of, of actors kind of grappling with this kind of um, kind of topic. Well, I would say all of the platforms are looking at this uh, and, you know, the, the climate change issues, you know, there's no one place that I think is just kind of saying, well, we're not impacted by climate change. As I think as Tom said, it's either too little water, too much water. Um, everyone's feeling it. I think what we're looking at is across the multi-stakeholder platforms, this idea of how do you drive resilience, right? Um, and so across the multi-stakeholder platforms, for example, looking at supply chain resilience, industrial resilience, um, how do we look at public sector systematic resilience um, across the institutions, and also now something that we're engaging on also with the multi-stakeholder platform is how do we look at it from a city scale? Um, so how do we build in resilience of cities um, and perhaps using the multi-stakeholder platform of 2030 WRG, the model at the city level is something that we're in discussions with cities about as well. So it's very much um, front and center um, considered, I think, you know, from this resilience standpoint, um, it is certainly adaptation, finding different solutions, but also the key, I think, to this is also institutional resilience, right? Um, we have institutions that, you know, in many respects are siloed um, and, and it's very difficult to tackle issues like climate change if you have institutions that are siloed. Um, and so this is where I think, you know, with us, at least with the multi-stakeholder platforms, we're trying to kind of bust those silos, if I can put it that way, because, you know, to tackle those challenges, again, it, it's really can't do it through a siloed approach. Um, and so, um, you know, how do we deal with that is one is just building the trust among stakeholders so that you can have dialogue across agriculture, across industry, across municipal services, um, you know, across the range of different actors is building that trust so that they can see each other and as joint solution providers rather than competitors, if I can put it that way. Mm, really interesting and really great that you mentioned resilience because it's actually coming up in a question and I just want to take maybe the opportunity to uh, share an anecdote related to your, um, you know, siloed institutions uh, points, which uh, last year, last couple of years, we were supporting a business improvement district in London um, on some of their sustainable development initiatives, one of which was they were championing was getting water points um, throughout this area of London. And so it was really born out of trying to tackle the plastic waste problem in single use packaging. So a lot of people, you know, if they could carry their own water bottle, <clears throat> would need places to refill it, excuse me. Um, and it was just it was so complicated to, to just get even a single water fountain put in, you know, in a station or near a central part of London, dealing with the council, dealing with, you know, um, all the different entities of the city, the companies that wanted to support it. And it was, it was quite a quagmire. And as you said, I think we did see some institutional silos there. Um, and it is about breaking through some of those barriers to get some of these, um, some of these ideas into place. But Tom, curious if you wanted to come in on, on, on this broader question. Uh, maybe just to sort of underline sort of the silos point and, and the need to you know, collaborate across civil society, private and public sector. I mean, on the silo point, you know, if you think of a policy perspective, often you know, water is a victim of, of poor 
uh, economic policy, land use policy, agricultural policy, for example. And it's not about improving water policy per se, but if we can get coherency across all these different policy domains that somehow impact on water, I think that's a, a big leap that we can take. So understand how water connects in at those policy levels and make sure that they are interconnected and don't work on silos. That, that's something that will you know, progress us further. And just to underscore this importance of the multi-stakeholder collaboration, you know, still to this day, water um, in, in a political space is very sensitive in terms of private sector participation. Um, there are ideologies that suggest that you know, water is, is, is something that should only be within the public sector domain in terms of the solution providers. But I think we need to get beyond that and understand you know, what are the solutions we need and who can de um, deliver those solutions. Some of them could be delivered by civil society, for example. But if we can, again, progress on this multi-stakeholder approach to solving some of our water challenges and get over some of these sort of ingrained notions that only the public sector can, can solve water challenges, I think, again, we'll, we'll make a lot of progress. Mm, interesting. Um, so maybe maybe to add to that, just I do want to do the question justice um, that we've had in the, the screen here is, you know, it says, so individual says that there's been a strong push for water efficiency, such as drip irrigation, but is efficiency enough? Are concepts like effectiveness and resilience also addressed by these programs? I think, Karen, you went some way to explaining um, certainly the focus on, on resilience, but wonder if there's anything else around around effectiveness and, and going beyond some of um, some of what we have today to, to make sure it will all add up to be enough. So. Well, I would say the thing I, think I would add in, on drip irrigation, for example, the, our, the multi-stakeholder and platform in Karnataka and in India um, was leading on an initiative called the Ramtal initiative, which was the um, introduction of the first of its kind lift drip irrigation scheme around, I think, 24,000 hectares. Um, and now the multi-stakeholder platform is looking how to scale this to 500,000 hectares and create kind of, in essence, a drip to market corridor um, where you bring in, um, you know, the government agencies, but with the private offtaker companies, the farmers and so forth. So I would think, I think I would, one thing I would add in there is, is also just making sure that, you know, the capacity of, of institutions and individuals is built throughout this process. And we've seen that through this effort with the introduction um, of this lift drip irrigation scheme, first of its kind in, in Ramtal, is also that, um, as I said, breaking down those silos, but making sure that momentum is continued and scaled. And I think that's where water has always seen a challenge in terms of innovation is how to scale. So certainly with the, the prize, as you move forward with the prize, it'll be great to see innovations that come forward and tackle that scale issue. We'll be very excited to see and see how we can bring those to certainly the multi-stakeholder platforms. Fantastic. Yes. Anything else from you, you Tom, on that particular point, effectiveness, resilience? And well, maybe just the short answer to the question that was posed is no we're not doing enough and and this is certainly the direction we need to sort of start framing um these kinds of solutions in yeah excellent um well as we near the end of our time i do want to maybe uh, send, put a kind of final prompt not seeing more more question from the the audience here but a final one for me which is kind of trying to get us to imagine the future a little bit so it's 2030 uh not 2020 what will success in the SDGs in navigating the pandemic mean for the world of water? So if, if we can successfully get through these, these challenges, both immediate and, and the 10 year time frame, what kind of world would we be seeing in 2030? What would that make possible from your perspectives? It's a, it's a big question. It's a big question, Tom, you wanna cover it? It's a big one. <laughs> well, a couple of, couple of thoughts. Um, I, I, Earlier this week, I was reading something on OECD um, had a report which was looking at innovation in the water sector, and it was looking at um, patents over the last couple of decades, for example. And it was interesting, you know, it said that you know, invention in this space is thriving. I think one in 77 patents are water related or, or something like that. So, you know, we've got enough problems to solve as, as we've addressed, and we've got enough bright people to solve these problems. Now, inventions um, are thriving in the water space. And I, it, but I think it comes down to deploying these inventions. Now, if you think innovation about being the broader process of taking an in, invention and applying it and scaling it you know, with finance policies and incentives, we really need to accelerate that space um, if we are going to you know, get to 2030 and be in a much better place than we are now. And then looking at 2030, you know, in terms of access to safe water and adequate sanitation, hundreds of millions, billions of people don't have that. You no. Know, are we going to connect all of those people in 10 years time 
maybe not but what we need to make sure of is that we're on the right trajectory um, over the coming years we lock in the right policies we rock in locking the right incentives for, for example so that's the important thing is to make sure we get back on track um, in 2018 uh, the UN um, released uh, an update report on the progress towards SDG 6 and you know it was very damning it said we're not on track to meet um, SDG 6 by 2030 there's a lot of work we need to do um, and I would like to see great progress on some of these enabling factors over the next five and 10 years. Maybe we don't hit the targets by 2030, but we should be going in the right direction. Mm, fantastic. Well, really positive to hear a, it's a great statistic around um, the patents and the, the invention space. And as you say, it makes it all, all the more important, those supporting features. And, and Karen, I want to come to you. I also want to give you an alternative question, if, if you prefer, which is around, you know, you could wave a magic wand here in 2020. What would, what would that one thing you'd wish for be uh, to get us, get us to 2030 and, and successful in the, in the SDGs in water? With water, I mean, I would, if I could wave a magic wand, I would just wave one and just have good governance in all of the watersheds and basins and the national level. If I could wave a magic wand and have good governance, I think, you know, then, you know, we'd meet the SDGs. Um, and, and so that would be the one where I would say that's the magic wand that I really want um, is to drive good governance um, on water in all river basins at all scales, um, nationally, sub-basin, regionally, that would be my wand of, my wand would be the good governance wand, if I can call it that. Yeah, and <laughs> fantastic. Um, we want to want to thank you both. One, I'm just going to say a few words um, about the prize in case a few missed it at the top of the hour. But huge thanks to, to you both. Um, and I think you know what was clear there in, in your final remarks is you know what what stands to benefit are billions of people around the world, their health, their their livelihoods, um, and their futures really um, potentially can hang in the balance of, of whether we achieve the 2030 agenda or not. Water is so crucial, um, and very much encouraged by the fact that there are so many inventions and, and innovations in this space. And, and to come back to the that sustainability prize, one of the reasons we're convening today. Um, there's a really fantastic opportunity out there for a, a pioneering innovation in, in water to to further their work. Um, so it is the it is a global award in sustainability in the areas of health, food, energy, and water, um, and in, in honor of, of trying to um, get the best innovations um, applying to and hopefully winning winning those awards. We're doing this webinar series around Build Back Better. So today was actually the first um, of, of a series. So focusing on each of those topics, really important to note the application date for the prize if you are working on a really high impact, innovative and inspiring sustainability solution in those areas um, is June 11th. So please do go to uh, the website you he see here to find out more information. And just to, to plug what we have coming in the remainder of the series um, on our next slide is we're gonna take each of these topics um, in turn probably contributing in a way to certain silos if you if you like, but very much uh, talking about the interconnections amongst these topics as well as tomorrow. So we're, we're back to um, back at the, the same time, at the same place, if you like, talking about food. So from seed to supply chain, and we we're really delighted to have Helen Monday, Chief Scientific Officer of the Food and Drink Federation, um, who's also involved in judging some of the prizes. So you get to hear from her. We've got Rob Cameron, who's Global Head of Public Affairs at Nestle, um, and Sabrina gonzalez krebsbach who is an Agricultural Commodity Specialist at WWF UK. So it will prove to be a dynamic discussion, no doubt, addressing similar questions um, in, the, in the arena of food this time, food and agriculture. And I, I think it really clear that there's so many interconnections across these spaces. It's, it's hard to have a conversation about any one of them and not address um, some of the questions and the others. So looking forward to that. Hope you can join us again um, if, if food is of interest and we'll probably also be publishing a bit of an article afterward reflecting on what we got um, out of in terms of insights from these conversations and, and webinars. So with that, I'm going to say a huge thank you to Tom and Karen for joining us uh, for this discussion this afternoon. Really pleased to have all of you who joined. Thanks for the, the, the questions and, and they were good ones as well. And we'll wish you all take care where you are, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you.